The Friends of the A, B, C. Part 1. At that period, apparently indifferent, something of a revolutionary thrill was vaguely felt. Whispers coming from the depths of 89 and 92 were in the air. Young Paris was, excuse the expression, in the process of molting. People were transformed almost without suspecting it by the very movement of the time. The hand which moves over the dial moves also among souls. Each one took the step forward which was before him. Royalists became liberals. Liberals became Democrats. It was like a rising tide, complicated by a thousand ebbs. The peculiarity of the ebb is to make mixtures. Thence, very singular combinations of ideas. Men worshipped at the same time Napoleon and Liberty. We are now writing history. These were the mirages of that day. Opinions passed through place phases. Voltairean royalism, a grotesque variety, had a fellow not less strange, Bonapartist liberalism. Other groups of minds were more serious. They fathomed principle. They attached themselves to right. They longed for the absolute. They caught glimpses of the infinite realizations. The absolute, by its very rigidity, pushes the mind toward the boundless and makes it float in the Ill illimitable. There is nothing like dream to create the future. Utopia today, flesh and blood tomorrow. At that time, there were not yet in France any of those underlying organizations, like the German Turgenbund and the Italian Carbonari. But here and there were obscure excavations branching out. La Cougourde was assuming form at A. There was in Paris, among the other affiliations of this kind, the Society of the Friends of the A, B, C. Who were the Friends of the A, B, C? A society having as its aim, in appearance, the education of children, in reality, the elevation of men. They declared themselves the Friends of the A, B, C. The A, B, C, the abased, were the people. They wished to raise them up. The friends of the Abbé Say were not numerous. It was a secret society in the embryonic state. We should almost say a coterie. The coteries produced heroes. They met in Paris at two places, near the Halle, in a wine shop called Corin, which will be referred to hereafter, and near the Pantheon, in a little coffee house on the Place Saint-Michel called Le Café Musin, now torn down. The first of these two places of rendezvous was near the working men, the second near the students. The ordinary conventicles of the friends of the ABC were held in a back room of the Café Musin. This room, quite distant from the café, with which it communicated by a very long passage, had two windows and an exit by a private stairway upon the little Rue de Grey. They smoked, drank, played and laughed there. They talked very loud about everything and in whispers about something else. On the wall was nailed, an indication sufficient to awaken the suspicion of a police officer, an old map of France under the Republic. Most of the friends of the ABC were students, in thorough understanding with a few working men. The names of the principals are as follows. They belong to a certain extent to history. Angerola, Cumfer, Jean Prouvert, Foy, Coferrec, Baurel, L'Aigle, Joly, Grantaire. These young men constituted a sort of family among themselves by force of friendship. All except L'Aigle was some from the south. Angerola, whom we have named first, the reason why will be seen by and by, was an only son and was rich. Anchola was a charming young man who was capable of being terrible. He was angelically beautiful. He was Antonus Wilde. You would have said, to see the thoughtful reflection of his eye, they had already, in some preceding existence, passed through the revolutionary apocalypse. He had the tradition of it like an eyewitness. He knew all the little details of the grand thing, a pontifical and warrior nature, strange in a youth, he was officiating and militant, from the immediate point of view, a soldier of democracy, above the movement of the time, a priest of the ideal. Beside Angerola, who represented the logic of the revolution, Cumfer represented its philosophy. Between the logic of the revolution and its philosophy, there is this difference, that its logic could conclude with war, while its philosophy could only end in peace. Cumfer completed and corrected Angerola. He was lower and broader, his desire was to instill into all minds the broad principles of general ideas. He said, revolution, but civilization. And, and about the steep mountain, he spread the vast blue horizon. Hence, in all Cumfer's views, there was something attainable and practical. Revolution with Cumfer was more respirable than with Angerola. Angerola expressed its divine right, and Cumfer its natural right. Jean Prouvaire was a shade yet more subdued than Confer. 
Jean Prouvaire was addicted to love. He cultivated a pot of flowers, played on the lute, made verses, loved the people, mourned over women, wept over childhood, confounded the future and God in the same faith, and blamed the revolution for having cut off a royal head, that of André Chénier. All day he pondered over social questions, wages, capital, credit, marriage, religion, liberty of thought, liberty of love, education, punishment, misery, association, property, production, and distribution, the lover enigma which covers the human anthill with a shadow. And at night he gazed upon the stars, those enormous beings. Like Anshola, he was rich and an only son. He spoke gently, bent his head, cast down his eyes, smiled with embarrassment, dressed badly, had an awkward air, blushed at nothing, was very timid, still intrepid. Foy was a fan maker, an orphan, who with difficulty earned three francs a day, and who had but one thought to deliver the world. He had still another desire, to instruct himself, which he also called deliverance. He had taught himself to read and write, all that he knew he had learned alone. Foy was a generous heart. He had an immense embrace. This orphan had adopted the peoples. He nurtured within himself, with a deep divination of the man of the people, what we now call the idea of nationalities. His speciality was Greece, Poland, Hungary, the Danubian provinces and Italy. This poor working man had made himself a teacher of justice, and she rewarded him by making him grand. Enjolras was the chief, Cumfer was the, the guide, Coferac was the centre. The others gave more light. He gave more heat. The truth is that he had all the qualities of a centre, roundness and radiance. Baorel was a creature of great humour and bad company, brave, a spendthrift, prodigal almost to generosity, talkative almost to eloquence, bold almost to effrontery, the best possible devil's pie, with foolhardy waistcoats and scarlet opinions, a wholesale blusterer, that is to say, liking nothing so well as a quarrel unless it were a mute, and nothing so well as an mute unless it were a revolution, always ready to break a paving stone, then to tear up a street, then to demolish a government, to see the effect of it, a student of the eleventh year. He served as a bond between the friends of the ABC and some other groups, which were without definite shape, but which were to take form afterward. In this conclave of young heads, there was one bald member, L'Aigle. The king had given his father the post office at Mur. Either intentionally or advertently, he assigned his name L'Aigle de Mur. His comrades, for the sake of brevity, called him Bousset. Bousset was a cheery fellow who was unlucky. His speciality was to succeed in nothing. On the other hand, he laughed at everything. Joly was a young malade imaginaire. What he had learned in medicine was rather to be a patient than a physician. At 23, he thought himself a valetudinarian and passed himself in looking at his tongue in a mirror. Nevertheless, he was the gayest of all. All these incoherences, young, notional, sickly, joyous, got along very well together, and the result was an eccentric and agreeable person. All these young men, diverse as they were, and of whom, as a whole, we ought to speak seriously, had the same religion, progress. All were legitimate sons of the French Revolution. The lightest became solemn when pronouncing this date, 89. Their fathers, according to the flesh, were, or had been, foyants, royalists, doctrinaires. It mattered little. This hurly-burly which antedated them had nothing to do with them. They were young. The pure blood of principles flowed in their veins. They attached themselves without an inter in to immediate shade, to incorruptible right, and to absolute duty. Affiliated and initiated, they secretly sketched out their ideas. Among all these passionate hearts and all these doubting minds, there was just one sceptic. How did he happen to be there? From juxtaposition. The name of this sceptic was Grantaire. All these words, rights of the people, rights of man, social contract, French Revolution, Republic, democracy, humanity, civilization, religion, progress, were to Grantaire very nearly meaningless. He smiled at them. Skepticism, that cries of the intellect, had not left one entire shape in his mind. He lived in irony. Still, this skeptic had a fanaticism. This fanaticism was neither an idea, nor a dogma, nor an art, nor a science. It was a man, Enjolras. Grantaire admired, loved, and vener venerated Enjolras. To whom did this anarchical doubter ally himself in this phalanx of absolute minds? To the most absolute. In what way did Enjolras subjugate him? By ideas? No, by a character. Grantaire, in whom doubt was creeping, loved to see faith soaring in Enjolras. Enjolras, being a believer, 
disdained this sceptic, and being sober scorned this drunkard. He granted him a little haughty pity. Grantaire was an unaccepted Pilab, always rudely treated by Enjolras, harshly repelled, rejected, yet returning he said of Enjolras, what a fine statue. On a certain afternoon, which had, as we shall see, some coincidence with events before related, Leg de Mur was leaning lazily back against the doorway of the Café Musin. He had the appearance of a caratidid in a vacation. He was supporting nothing but his reverie. He was looking at the Place Saint-Michel. Reverie does not hinder a cabriolet from going by, nor the dreamer from noticing the cabriolet. Leg de Mur, whose eyes were wandering in a sort of general stroll, perceived, through all his somnambulism, a two-wheeled vehicle turning into the square, which was moving at a walk, as if undecided. What did this cabriolet want? Why was it moving at a walk? Leg looked at it. There was inside, beside the driver, a young man, and before the young man, a large carpet bag. The bag exhibited to the passers this name, written in big black letters upon a card sewed to the cloth, Marius Pontmercy. This name changed Leg's attitude. He straightened up and addressed this apostrophe to the young man in the cabriolet. Monsieur Marius Pontmercy? The cabriolet thus called upon stopped. The young man, who seemed profoundly musing, raised his eyes. Well, said he, you are Monsieur Mar Marius Pontmercy? Certainly. I was looking for you, said Le Glumeur. How is that? inquired Marius. I do not know you. You were not at school yesterday. It is possible. It is certain. You are a student? inquired Marius. Yes, monsieur, like you. The day before yesterday, I happened to go into the school. You know, one sometimes has such notions. The professor was about to call the roll. You know they're very ridiculous just at that time. If you miss the third call, they erase your name. Sixty francs gone. Marius began to listen. Leg continued. It was Blondeau who was calling the roll. You know Blondeau. He has a very sharp and very malicious nose, and delights in smelling out the absent. The roll went on well. No erasure. The universe was present. Blondeau was sad. I said to myself, Blondeau, my love, you won't do the slightest execution today. Suddenly, Blondeau calls. Marius Pontmercy? Nobody answers. Blondeau, full of hope, repeats louder. Marius Pontmercy? And he seizes his pen. Monsieur, I have bowels. I said to myself rapidly, here's a brave fellow who's going to be erased. Attention, let us save him. Death to Blondeau. At that moment, Blondeau dipped his pen, black with erasures, into the ink, cast his tawny eye over the room, and repeated for the third time, Marius Pontmercy. I answered, present. In that way, you were not erased. Monsieur, said Marius. And I was, added Leg Demure. I do not understand you, said Marius. Leg resumed. Nothing more simple. I was near the chair to answer, and near the door to escape. The professor was looking at me with a certain fixedness. Suddenly, Blondeau leaps to the letter L. L is my letter. I'm of Mure, and my name is Leg. Leg, interrupted Marius. What a fine name. Monsieur the Blondeau re-echoes this fine name and cries, Leg? I answer, present. The Blondeau looks at me with the gentleness of a tiger, smiles and says, If you are Pontmercy, you are not Leg. A phrase which is uncomplimentary to you, but which brought me only to grief. So saying, he erases me. Marius exclaimed, Monsieur, I'm mortified. Leg burst out laughing. And I, in raptures, I was on the brink of being a lawyer. This rupture saves me. I intend to pay you a solemn visit of thanks. Where do you live? In this cabriolet, said Marius. A sign of opulence, replied Lagley calmly. I congratulate you. You have here rent of 9,000 francs a year. Just then, Corfreyrac came out of the cafe. Marius smiled sadly. I've been paying this rent for two hours, and I hope to get out of it, but it's the usual story. I do not know where to go. Monsieur, said Corfreyrac, come home with me. And that same evening... Marius was installed in a room at the Hotel de la Porte Saint-Jacques, side by side with Courfeyrac. Part 3 In a few days, Marius was the friend of Courfeyrac. Youth is the season of prompt weldings and rapid catrizations. Marius, in Courfeyrac's presence, breathed freely. A new thing for him. Courfeyrac asked him no questions. He did not even think of it. At that age, the countenance tells all at once. Speech is useless. There are some young men of whom we might say their physiognomies are talkative. They look at one another, they know one another. Corfeyrac introduced Marius to the Café Musin. Then he whispered in his ear with a smile, I must give you your admission into the revolution. And he took him into the room of the friends of the ABC. He presented him to the other members, saying in an undertone, this simple word, which Marius did not understand, a pupil. 
Marius had fallen into a mental wasp's nest. Still, although silent and serious, he was not less winged nor the less armed. Marius, up to this time solitary and inclined to soliloquy and privacy by habit and by taste, was a little bewildered at this flock of young men about him. All these different progressives attacked him at once and perplexed him. The tumultuous sweep and sway of all these minds at liberty and at work set his ideas in a whirl. Sometimes, in the confusion, they went so far from him that he had some difficulty in finding them again. He heard talk of philosophy, of literature, of art, of history, of religion, in a style he had not looked for. He caught glimpses of strange appearances, and, as he did not bring them into perspective, he was not sure that it was not chaos that he saw. On abandoning his grandfather's opinions for his father's, he had thought himself settled. He now suspected with anxiety, and without daring to confess it to himself that he was not. The angle under which he saw all things was beginning to change anew. A certain oscillation shook the whole horizon of his brain. A strange internal moving day. He almost suffered from it. It seemed that there were to these men no sacred things. Marius heard upon every subject a singular language annoying to his still timid mind. None of these young men uttered this word, the emperor. Jean Prouvaire alone sometimes said Napoleon. All the rest said Bonaparte. Enjolras pronounced Buonaparte. Marius became confusedly astonished. Initium sapien sapientiae. Part 4. Of the conversations among these men, which Marius frequented, and in which he sometimes took part, one shocked him severely. This was held in the back room of the Café Musain. Nearly all the friends of the Abbé Say were together that evening. The large lamp was ceremoniously lighted. They talked of one thing and another, without passion and with noise. A stern thought, oddly brought out a clatter of words, suddenly crossed the tumult of speech in which Gonterre, Barouel, Prouvaire, Bousset, Cumfer, and Courfeyrac were confusedly fencing. In the midst of the uproar, Bousset suddenly ended some apostrophe to Cumfer with this date, the 18th of June, 1815, Waterloo. Pardieu, exclaimed Courfeyrac, that number 18 is strange and striking to me. It is the fatal number of Bonaparte, put Louis before and Brumaire behind. You have the, the part. You have the whole destiny of the man, with this expressive peculiarity that the beginning is hard pressed by the end. Antrola, till now dumb, broke the silence, and thus addressed Courfeyrac. You mean the crime by the expiation? This word, crime, exceeded the limits of the endurance of Marius, already much excited by the abrupt evocation of Waterloo. Marius turned towards Enjolras, and his voice rang with a vibration which came from the quivering of his nerves. I am a newcomer among you, but I confess you astound me. Where are we? Who are we? Who are you? I thought that you were young men. Where is your enthusiasm, then? And what do you do with it? Whom do you admire if you do not admire the emperor? And what more must you have if you do not like that great man? What great men would you have? Be just, my friends. To be the empire of such an emperor? What a splendid destiny for a people, when that people is France, and when it adds its genius to the genius of such a man, to be the grand nation, and to bring forth the grand army, to send your legions flying over the world, as a mountain sends its eagles upon all sides, to vanquish, to rule, to thunderstrike, to be in Europe a kind of gilded people, through much glory, to sound through history a titan trumpet call, to conquer the world twice, by conquest and by resplendence, this is sublime, and what can be more grand? To be free, said Confer. Marius, in his turn, bowed his head. These cold and simple words had pierced his epic effusion like a blade of steel, and he felt it vanish within him. When he raised his eyes, Confer was there no longer. Suddenly they heard Confer sing as he was going downstairs. It was, Conf it was Confer, and what he was singing is this. Si César m'avait donné la gloire et le gueur, Et qu'il me faille quitter la mort de ma mère, je dirai à grand César, en prendrant cette heure et ton char, j'aime mieux ma mère au goût, j'aime mieux ma mère. The wild and tender accent with which Confer sang gave to this stanza a great, grand, strange grandeur. Marius, thoughtful, and with his eyes directed to the ceiling, repeated almost mechanically, My mother. At this moment, he felt Enjolras's hand on his shoulder. Citizen, said Enjolras to him, My mother 
is the Republic. Part five. That evening left Marius in a profound agitation, with sorrowful darkness in his soul. He was experiencing what perhaps the earth experiences at the moment when it is furrowed with the share of the grains of wheat that may be sown. It feels the wound alone. The thrill of the germ and the joy of the fruit do not come until later. Marius was gloomy. He had but attained a faith. Could he so soon reject it? He decided within himself that he could not. He declared to himself that he would not doubt, and that he began to doubt in spite of himself. To be between two religions, one which you have not yet abandoned, and another which you have not yet adopted, is insupportable, and twilight is pleasant only to bat-like souls. Marius was an open eye, and he needed the true light. To him the dusk of doubt was harmful. Whatever might be his desire to stop where he was, and to hold fast there, he was irresistibly compelled to continue, to advance, to examine, to think, to go forward. Where was that going to lead him? He feared, after having taken so many steps which brought him nearer to his father, to na take now any steps which should separate them. His dejection increased with every reflection which occurred to him. Steep cliffs rose about him. He was on good terms neither with his grandfather nor with his friends, rash towards the former, backward towards the others, and he felt doubly isolated from old age and also from youth. He went no more to the Café Musain. In this trouble, in which his mind was plunged, he scarcely gave thought to a certain serious phases of existence. The realities of life do not allow themselves to be forgotten. They came and jogged his memory sharply. One morning, the keeper of the house entered Marius' room and said to him, Monsieur Kouferrec is responsible for you. Yes? But I am in need of money. Ask Kouferrec to come and speak with me, said Marius. Kouferrec came, the host left them. Marius related to him what he had not thought of telling him before, that he was, so to speak, alone in the world without any relatives. What are you going to become? said Kouferrec. I've no idea, answered Marius. Meanwhile, Aunt Gillemont, who really was a kind person on sad occasions, had finally unearthed Marius' lodgings. One morning, when Marius came home from the school, he found a letter from his aunt and sixty pistoles, that is to say six hundred francs in gold in a sealed box. Marius sent the thirty louis back to his aunt with a respectful letter in which he told her that he had the means of living and that he could provide henceforth for himself. At that time, he had three francs left. The aunt did not inform the grandfather of this refusal, lest she should exasperate him. Indeed, had he not said, let nobody ever speak to me of this blood drinker? Marius left the Port Saint-Jacques Hotel, unwilling to contract debt.